may be up to be presented by Dr. Hassam Al-Amri. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, at the beginning, I would like to uh, thank the organizing committee for giving us the chance to share our experience in laparoscopic sleep gastrectomy and pediatric and adult patients. Uh, we have nothing to disclose. Uh, the global obesity epidemic is one of the major health problems facing the world today. Uh, in the United States, 32% of children and adolescents are either overweight or obese, of which 17% are obese. Uh, this is not only in the United States, it is a global health problem. And as the prevalence of obesity increases, the prevalence of obesity-related comorbidities increased, where uh, 42 to 64 percent of children carrying the burden of their disease into their adulthood, increasing the mortality after the age of 30. These uh, obese children also have reduced quality of life, so it's extremely important uh, to recognize and treat the problem of childhood obesity. Unfortunately, uh, there are currently no effective treatment except for surgery. The bariatric surgery is the most effective treatment in morbidly obese adults. However, in the pediatric age group, this subject is most controversial due to multiple concerns, like what type of procedure is more suitable for these patients, what is the safety and efficacy of uh, different procedures, and what is the ability of this age group to uh, comply to the follow-up visits and instructions, and of course, we like the uh, data on the long-term complications and the adverse effects, uh, effects on the growth and maturation. Uh, in sleeve gastrectomy, there are only limited case reports on the pediatric age group, and the safety and efficacy of this procedure in this age group has not yet been established. There are no previous studies comparing uh, sleeve gastrectomy between pediatric and adult patients. So we conducted this study to evaluate the safety and efficacy of uh, laparoscopic sleeve gastrectomy in pediatric patients and compare them to adults uh, in terms of weight loss, uh, complications, comorbidity resolution, and compliance. Uh, after obtaining an IRB approval, we um, performed a retrospective review of a prospectively collected uh, data. A multidisciplinary team assisted patients for eligibility. Patients were eligible if they had a BMI above 40 or above 35 with uh, severe comorbidities and failed to uh, lose a significant uh, weight after six months of a weight loss program and, of course, uh, obtained a positive psychological evaluation. All patients followed a standard clinical pathway designed by our team. Uh, baseline measurements and laboratory testing were obtained for all patients. This is, again, our um, clinical pathway. We have two components, the outpatient and the inpatient. Uh, at the outpatient, uh, we treat different patients uh, according to their BMI, and if they qualify for surgery, then they go to our um, inpatient um, clinical pathway where we have a specific protocol for pre-admission uh, the date of admission and surgery and, and post-operative care. Uh, the laparoscopic sleeve gastrectomy is followed as standard after inserting a tube size 36, sometimes 34 in younger patients. Uh, the stable line is carried from uh, three to four centimeters from the pylorus up to the angle of his. And we follow up our patients at uh, three, six, 12 months and annually thereafter. And at each follow-up visit, we evaluate, of course, for the weight loss, for the comorbidity resolution and complications and we collect all these data prospectively into a dedicated database for our patients. Uh, we, uh, in this study, we are comparing 108 pediatric patients to a similar group of 114 adult patients. Our pediatric patients included seven patients uh, with Prader-Willi syndrome, uh, two patients with Prader beetle and uh, three patients with mental retardation, and one patient with Down syndrome. For our patient characteristics, of course, the two groups differed in age. And we had a little bit more females in our adult group, but um, for, for BMI, diabetes, hypertension, uh, dyslipidemia, and obstructive sleep apnea, both groups were similar. Uh, in our study, we report weight loss using um, different outcome measures. Uh, we personally believe uh, excess BMI loss is more suitable and accurate for a pediatric age group. However, we also included excess weight loss to allow for comparison between studies. And uh, as you can see here, our pediatric group achieved the excess BMI loss at three and six months of 36 and 58 compared to 34 and 60 for our adult group. At 12 months, uh, the excess BMI loss was 71 compared to 73 at the adult group. And at 24 months, the excess BMI loss was 76 in both groups. So as, again, as we saw here with the absolute BMI, both groups were uh, similar at each follow-up point. 
for committee's resolution uh, regarding diabetes, hypertension, dyslipidemia, and symptoms of obstructive sleep apnea, uh, the resolution in both groups were similar, uh, ranging from 70 to 100 percent. Our pediatric group had the complication rate of 5.6 percent compared to 7 percent in the adult group. Uh, however, we noticed that our pediatric patient had less serious complications. We had no uh, leak in our pediatric group compared to uh, uh, one case of leak in the adult group, and both groups had zero uh, mortality. Uh, to our surprise, the compliance of the pediatric patients was better than the adult patient. Uh, our pediatric group attended 71% compared to 61% in the adult group, and more importantly, only 40% of our pediatric patients missed at least one follow-up visit compared to 84% uh, in the adult group. The number of bariatric surgery being performed in uh, pediatric-ish group has been increasing. A systemic review in 2008 included uh, more than 600 cases, uh, mainly uh, in gastric banding and gastric bypass. Uh, this systemic review did not include sleeve, which we believe is an attractive option for young patients because it doesn't have the significant malabsorptive component and it doesn't include the implantation of a foreign body requiring uh, frequent adjustments. Uh, in adults, sleeve uh, is reported to achieve an excess weight loss of 60% in a follow-up period ranging from 3 to six, uh, 36 months. And in the, as we mentioned earlier, in pediatric patients, uh, there are only few case reports uh, ranging from one patient to seven patients achieving an excess weight loss of 32 up to 79%. Uh, our results are also similar um, to the results achieved by other uh, bariatric procedures in the same age group. The comorbidity resolution in our study ranged in the pediatric group uh, from 70 to 94 percent. This is similar to what has been reported in the systemic review, where the um, comorbidity resolution rated from 50 to 100 percent. Of course, the complications vary among procedures in bariatric surgery. Our pediatric patients had the complication rate of 5.6 compared to 7 percent. This is similar to what has been reported in adult patients, where the complication rate uh, was reported to have a mean of 11 percent. Looking at uh, other uh, bariatric procedures in pediatric patients, uh, uh, in eight studies in gastric banding in the same systemic review, in 352 patients, 8 8% patient, 8 of the patient uh, had to be reoperated uh, mainly due to band slippage. And looking at six uh, studies of uh, gastric banding, there were eight uh, reports of potentially life-threatening events, including uh, severe mal malnutrition, uh, pulmonary, pulmonary embolism, and shock, and there was one report of, of death. Our pediatric patients had less serious complications. This uh, has been seen in a, a, another study in adolescents after uh, gastric banding, gastric bypass, and gastroplasty, where the adolescent had a complication rate of 5.5% compared to 9.8. Again, we saw that our um, pediatric patients were more compliant, and we believe that the family participation played a major role in that. So when you have uh, a child uh, like this who is crippled, with the diabetes and sleep apnea, sleeping, sitting, I think uh, preferring giving the option to help this patient is, is very, um, a very uh, you know, reasonable thing to do. So we conclude by saying that lap laparoscopic sleeve gastrectomy uh, in pediatric patient is at least as safe as it is in the adult group. Our pediatric patients were more compliant with the follow-up than adults and had less serious complications and we believe that uh, long-term results uh, will further qualify the safety and efficacy of this procedure. Uh, thank you so much. So, uh, thank you, Dr. Al-Amri. Um, Dr. Shower will initiate the uh, discussion from the floor. Yeah, congratulations on uh, one of the largest series of uh, pediatric bariatric surgery in the literature so far. Quite striking how young your population was going down to the age of five. I think that is the youngest reported uh, group in the literature. Um, what measures did your group take uh, to maximize non-surgical treatment before you subjected these patients to potentially, you know, operations with serious complications? Uh, thank you for your question. Uh, this is a very uh, good question. Uh, we operate in a multidisciplinary team. We have uh, dietitians, we have uh, physiotherapists, psychologists, pediatric endocrinologists, and surgeons. So we, all our patients undergo uh, an extensive weight loss program for at least six, year, six months, and sometimes for even longer. Uh, we, don't, uh, we don't operate on patients and, and unless we feel that 
uh, after the failure of this period that the benefits from the surgery is, uh, you know, outweigh the, the risk of, of not operating because some of these kids have severe comorbidities, uh, you know, extensive, uh, severe sleep apnea, some of them have multiple arrests. So sometimes this, uh, you know, this surgery is, is life-saving for these patients, uh, you know. So we believe the age is not the concern as much as the uh, severity of the comorbidity of the patients. Yeah, just to follow up, most of you consider this quite aggressive uh, therapy, uh, sort of pushing the envelope. And regarding the compliance issue, how did you measure compliance? Was it just, did they show up to the clinic, or did you measure, were they taking their vitamins, were they compliance with dietary measures, uh, and other follow-up issues? Uh, and, and what we reported here, we only uh, reported the compliance to, you know, showing up to the uh, clinic and seeing the multidisciplinary team. However, um, we are still looking at, uh, you know, other measurement of compliance regarding, uh, the, you know, how, how good are they following the exercise and diet. But what we reported here only for the visits. It, it looked like in the two-year group that the compliance was falling off the pediatric compared to the adult. Is that not correct in the abstract? Um, in the abstract, sorry? Yeah, yeah, there was lower compliance at two years in the pediatric group yes, than the adult. Yes, yes, yes. That's, uh, that's right. There's a question that came through on Twitter. Uh, again, it, it relates a little bit to what Dr. Schauer asked uh, regarding the lower end age group, the younger people. Uh, as part of the evaluation for uh, prior to bariatric surgery, generally the psych psychological evaluation is required. How are you able to do an appropriate uh, and complete psychological evaluation on children as young as five years? Um, uh, thank you for your question. Um, for, uh, we have a, a, a dedicated uh, psychologist in our clinic. Who, uh, who does the uh, psychology evaluation. Uh, this is not only for the patients, also for the family, and how, are they, um, how motivated they are and how compliant uh, th we feel that they are going to be with the future follow-up visits. And uh, for the patients with the low age, I think uh, if, if you, um, whoever attended the debate yesterday, uh, we believe that for these patients in particular, the severity of the comorbidities, you know, um, play the major role in, in the decision of, of t doing the surgery in these patients. Thank you. A question in this microphone. Uh, thank you, Dr. Amr, for your presentation. Uh, actually, your study have uh, changed two factors which used to be like uh, for children group, you know, growth and the parameters of uh, uh, growth was a major factor and that's why everybody was in favor of banding as a restrictive rather than something that changed their anatomy. I believe Dr. al Qahtani as well uh, presented a few years ago the success of uh, banding for children and adolescents in Saudi Arabia. Uh, my question is, uh, you did not mention about their growth parameter, if there is any failure of strive, or, and did you have any comparison between your older experience with gastric banding for kids versus uh, your new experience about sleeve gastrectomy? And uh, my second question regarding uh, patients uh, who has some mental disabilities, you have mentioned few of them, how was their compliance to post-operative uh, regime of food and things like that? Thank you. Uh, thank you for your question. I think your question had uh, two parts. Uh, the first part about uh, growth and nutrition. When we looked at the data of the patients, not shown here, uh, we d there was no difference in, in, um, in, in you know, micronutrient levels and micronutrient levels uh, pre and post surgery. Of course, we test the patients for all these levels preoperative, and we correct them, and we follow them uh, after the surgery. And and we, you know, if they are deficient, we correct them for that. But we saw that uh, their growth is, is good. Uh, we are working into um, you know uh, getting this data and, and you know p p putting it up there and publishing it to see it. And um, regarding the other part of your question, uh, you you asked about uh, you know comparing banding to sleeve. Uh, I think this is, um, you know, something that we uh, might uh, look at, maybe prospectively uh, better, better. And uh, for the mental retardation patients, uh, for example, our experience in Prada Woolley patients, um, they do comply better. And we've seen a Prada Woolley patient uh, saying for the first time in their life that, uh, you know, they feel satisfied and they don't need to eat anymore, so. So, so we had a couple of questions came in, not on the topic of consent and your multidisciplinary team, but on the topic of the ethics involving making permanent decisions in children, which gets to the idea of assent. And in many studies, you know, the 
uh, research studies require the assent of a child who at the age of five can't, can't even assent. So did you have a team uh, discuss the ethical issues, perhaps weighing the benefits of a band where a child who becomes an adult could choose to take the band out if they want because they can't choose to have their stomach put back in. So how did you deal with this from a straight ethics point of view? Uh, yes, uh, thank you for your question. Um, uh, our series included patients that range from 5 uh, to 21 years. Uh, our patients who are uh, in this low, low part were only few patients and as we explained the severity of the comorbidities, uh, you know, uh, you know, um, outweigh the the, uh, the risk. Uh, so, for consenting the patients, uh, of course, we explain uh, to the patient and to the, their family uh, the the nature of the procedure and the uh, the lack of the long term outcome data. And we explain all the information that we have. And we offer them actually all all different kinds of uh, of bariatric procedures. Uh, for for example, banding and uh, sleep and for uh, older patients bypass. And, you know, we, we worked in it with the, our IRB group uh, to uh, see uh, uh, how to properly consent these patients and what uh, to explain to them to, uh, and what options to give to them, uh, you know, to help them uh, choose the uh, procedure that they want to, you know, follow with. Very interesting topic. Uh, we have to move on. Thank you very much. Thank you so much.